But what, what does it mean? You send me a message. Uh, you will an email. Let me uh, no no. That, so it, it I think it was Luca or who was writing it. Uh, that uh, that one should uh, that you are, that you are making me co-host. But what what does it mean if I'm you are so be co-host? Essentially, it's just uh, more rights with respect to the normal uh, normal participants. Okay. You can share a screen. You can you know. Uh, yeah. Okay. So whenever you want, yeah, etc. Luca Ma Maxim is there. Uh, can you make him co-host so that he can present? Yeah, Max this I saw Maxim going through also a moment ago. Hello. Hi. Oh, where uh, is hi. hi, Maxim. Where is Maxim? I'm not seeing him. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I see. You have to restrict the view. <laughs> uh, ah, yes, there he is. Oh, hello, Maxim. How are you doing? Look, uh, Belen, I have your coffee oh. from from uh, from Madrid, which is oh. this is a special place in my heart because it was the last meeting I could go th uh, to, <laughs> and then there was a pandemic. The right? pandemic, right? So yeah, that it was, and the drawing was done by one of our students who is now she's a postdoc in Caltech. What is the name? I am forgetting. Enrique, la estudiante de Pavel. Clara. Clara, Clara, Clara Murgi. Clara Murgi. And I think this year the drawing of the of the tree, which is the madroño, the arbutus, and the and the bear looking at the computer, that I think is another of our students, Salvador Rosauro, I think. So you will have I know you are not having a cup, only the students who get a a PhD poster prize. Huh? You know, we this this time. Okay, next time we will have a nice cup for you again. We hope to see you again. It would be a nice thing, Maxim, if you reconnect. Yeah, I, I would love to. Yes, through IFT. Okay, so we take your word for it. My hope is to reconnect through Hamburg, um, yes. because of a special place. <laughs> so let's try. Although you know that they are trying to organize this conference in the South Seas in. IT. No, I will not go. But uh, ah, yeah, yeah, no, this is yeah. so much. By the way, I I sorry to organizers. I I messed up with with my Indico and stuff, and I emailed you my talk. Right, so if you could upload it, please. No okay. problem. But you can also share a screen. Eh? Those talks. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the other will do. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so no problem. Yeah. <laughs> So we are letting people in slowly. Yeah, people wait to the last minute. I will have them piling up there. And what is this? George Jacker is there, but he does not need to be host now. Okay. Fernando Arias is asking to, he has to be co-host. Luca, can you make him? Oh, I do. I'm gonna do that, don't worry. Oh, I do, yeah, I'm admitting. It seems so far away, Maxim, that that meeting, it was a nice meeting. And I remember it was a nice meeting and it is I, far away. They, they, I, they did yeah, a complete they, change to all our lives. And, uh, oh my goodness, seems even farther away. It was a very good talk, I remember. But yeah. It was a lifetime away. <laughs> it was another another world, yes, yes, yes. Yes, and for this time really was there, there. Yeah, now everybody appears now. Right. 
I observed that the peak is like two minutes, so three after starting, then there is a pile up of people. <laughs> but we start typically. It's very hard to keep self discipline of showing up to meetings. Uh, <laughs> So maybe we should start. I mean, people are going to be doubling in the next uh, five minutes, but uh, um, sure, okay. Then, then I so uh, the, the, I pass I the, pass the stage to uh, where are you, Andreas? Andreas is here, the, yes, the, the maître de cérémonie. Oh. So go ahead. Oh, hello, hello, everybody. Uh, I encourage you to switch on your your uh, videos, just that the speaker don't doesn't have to talk so much to black to so many black boxes but uh, <laughs> and uh, and so uh, so we are we are happy to have now as a speaker Maxim Pospilov and he will talk about novel signatures of dark matter bound formation uh, so ah here I see your screen okay um, and I see your mouse so it's correct you and the full screen, like the screen that. Also works. And try if you can uh, see the next page. Whether it, sorry, it see. Yeah. Yes, it, well, it works. So fine. So please. Yeah, well, so uh, I may as well uh, start at this point. Uh, it's uh, great to be here, even uh, even virtually. I enjoyed the meeting. I, I like uh, very many talks, even though I kept quiet. I, I like also the very diverse uh, aspect of it uh, and the uh, diverse uh, cohort of participants. Uh, and of course, I miss uh, the time when we can all meet face to face. And I remember the, my first uh, Invisibles meeting at Lumley Castle in uh, 2013, which was very nice as well. So I'm going to talk about the work that um, I thought we would I, we would finish before before my talk, but usually how it works it's, it, it never never works that way. Anyways, this is a work in progress to appear this month uh, in collaboration with Asher Berlin, uh, Hong Wan Lu, and Harry Ramani, um, and this is for sorry, uh, for the bound state formation. So the main message is that the, uh, the exchange of dark photons um, in a certain corner of parameter space can um, lead to the uh, uh, fusion process where atom uh, meets uh, a subdominant component of dark matter and makes a bound state uh, ejecting electrons uh, and uh, photons that uh, reflect the, the value of the bound state energy. And this uh, uh, one can uh, uh, basically uh, uh, constrain or probe with, with the most sensitive experiments uh, there are on the market. Uh, so uh, speaking about the direct detection, uh, this is um, the direct detection as we know uh, place themselves uh, between uh, basically uh, in energy scale to the left of the super sensitive uh, uh, and large uh, neutrino detectors. Uh, um, and they, they're obviously smaller in, in mass. Uh, and until recently, they were not as, as uh, um, um, you know, showing a, 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 a super small sensitivity in, in terms of uh, counts. But uh, uh, recently, the, this uh, a suite of uh, xenon type experiments have achieved a, a really, really big progress at uh, sort of a, a frontier at the, from uh, KV to a few tens of KV. And uh, this is uh, becoming uh, one of the most important probes uh, um, of dark matter. Um, so here is the... Um, 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 picture of the xenon experiment, uh, xenon one ton, 
and uh, I won't uh, spend time how it works. You have better experts here. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to talk today is that we will try to uh, think of uh, uh, other ways the, the, this experimental data can be used. And one of the interesting possibilities is that it can be used to probe super rare species of dark matter. And I will argue that in some cases, the sensitivity to uh, dark matter species will reach the relative abundance of 10 to minus 14. So uh, that is uh, uh, the uh, kind of uh, direction of my talk. Uh, here is the, uh, the, the um, one of the representative uh, results of the, of the uh, Xenon style experiments where you see the constraints on the WIMP nuclear uh, cross section and the certain um, uh, assumptions about how they interact with, with nucleons. Um, you see, of course, the best sensitivities for the uh, um, uh, mass of the WIMPs, uh, not too far from the mass of the nucleus and so on. What I'd like to say is that on a vertical scale, it's, uh, of course, uh, uh, where we should be plotting um, it's almost a pathology, uh, uh, the cross section uh, times the concentration, right? And the concentration is the relative abundance of dark matter with one being, uh, being uh, you know, a saturation. This, the, uh, that's uh, um, uh, quite clear. Uh, and this plot for many models, you cannot of course take F as 10 to minus 10 because you will run into other constraints. But in principle, you know, uh, if once you see a positive signal, let's put it this way, uh, there is absolutely no argument that this comes from the entire dark matter. Or it comes from 1% of the dark matter with, with a cross section of 10 to minus 44 rather than 10 to minus 46, right? So, so that's, that's, uh, that's the, uh, um, uh, um, the starting point and we're going to take this F to be very, very small. Uh, all right. So of course there are zillions of models that uh, these experiments uh, constrain or uh, occasionally kill. So there is a Z mediation, Higgs boson mediation. And for today's talk, we are going to look at uh, dark matter talking to the STAIR model while dark photon that mixes with the regular photon. Um, and I'm going to take chi to be electroweak scale and dark photon as uh, low mass as possible. Also, uh, not uh, escaping our attention is, of course, that in 2020, uh, about a year ago, the, the collaboration Xenon one to one came up with, uh, with a paper that uh, is entitled uh, Electron Excess and so on. They, they were observing some, some modest excess of events at, uh, at, uh, at a, a, few, a couple of KV energy. Uh, uh, but what I'd like to you to, to 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 get impressed about is the the really really tiny counting rates that this experiment has achieved, uh, with with uh, excess being on the order of few tens of events per ton per year, uh, uh, and that is uh, that is uh, quite remarkable and uh, on par or even better than their projections uh, that they've uh, uh, put together in 2015. Uh, there are various ideas. Uh, the, the, the theorists, the, the first thing they did, they, they abandoned the idea that FK is equal to one, that many, many subdominant uh, dark matter species uh, could, could do this, this uh, or subdominant fluxes of, uh, of, uh, of dark matter or any other light particles could, could induce this signal. Um, and um, the dark photons, uh, um, the absorption of dark photons, for example, has been uh, suggested as one of the of the of the possibilities. And uh, or it could be um, like in Asher's paper, uh, some sort of a, uh, the excitation uh, of dark matter state that injects a KV scale energy uh, into into the system. But today we're going to talk about the. Uh, uh, KV scale that comes from the interaction of, of dark matter with the nucleus. So uh, dark matter uh, and the nucleus can have a KV scale 
binding energies. So uh, it's interesting that uh, there are several blind spots for direct detection that we have already discussed at this meeting. One of them associated with the very light dark matter that doesn't have much of the kinetic energy and you want to create new experiments that are sensitive to the very, very small energy release. I hasten to say that at this point, uh, the best sensitivity in that energy range uh, for uh, uh, dark matter comes from the xenon experiment as well, uh, via subdominant fluxes of dark matter being reflected by either cosmic rays or by, by the solar electrons. Well, uh, there is another blind spot that I think was mentioned already, that if there is a, a strongly interacting dark matter particle, maybe in subdominant concentrations, it quickly thermalizes, uh, gets the energy which is uh, really comparable to the thermal energy. And uh, well, it, it's then uh, far away from all the experimental thresholds and uh, you, you would uh, have uh, a difficult time on uh, accessing this energy uh, with existing experiments. Uh, all right. Um, so we, we've, um, uh, with, with some of my collaborators, we're thinking about it uh, quite a bit. And uh, here is, uh, for example, the, the, the plot on the cross-section of dark matter versus the, uh, the mass with the relative abundance of uh, dark matter of uh, uh, say 10 minus six of, of these particular particles and only the uh, sort of uh, balloon or surface experiments are somewhat sensitive to this. And uh, it's an interesting plot because you, you, you look, you move to a smaller cross section and you suddenly become sensitive because these particles can reach uh, underground without thermalizing. But there is a lot of white spot over here, okay? So, and uh, we had uh, in before suggested how one can use uh, some uh, uh, sort of uh, exotic nuclear isotopes for the excitation. So uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, the bound state formation and how it can circumvent this, uh, this uh, blind spot uh, for direct detection. And uh, I also would like to mention that uh, Dark matter nucleus bound states are being discussed in uh, in uh, in other contexts. For example, if you have uh, um, um, the um, uh, charged excitation of uh, of dark matter, and if the mass splitting is below a 20 MeV, you can get uh, a weak style capture because the negatively charged WIMPs would have uh, would have. Uh, sort of a 20 MeV kind of binding with, 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 with heavy elements. And you can, you can sort of try to hope uh, to, see, to see the capture that way. But that's, uh, that's the only, uh, well, one of the few examples that are being discussed in the literature. And this year there was a, a search performed by, uh, reported uh, by the Kamlan Zen experiment that also has a, a, a huge amount of, of xenon the, with the first constraints. Um, very well, so in coming to the meat of my talk, so I'm going to look at the model that is being very analyzed to death almost. Uh, so there is a dark photon kinetically mixed with a normal photon. The mediator has a mass and it talks to uh, a subdominant now, I'm going to assume that chi is a subdominant component of dark matter. So D has a, an A prime, uh, here uh, uh, field inside. Uh, so my primary choice of interest would be epsilon as large as 10 minus three. The mass of the mediator is uh, in the 10 to 100 MeV and the mass of the dark matter may be uh, or subdominant component for, of chi from 10 to uh, GVs to hundreds of GVs and sort of a larger alpha dark, but in that range, sort of starting from 10 minus two and to one, right? So this, uh, uh, given the choice of parameters and the assumption of thermal history, the in principle one can calculate, of course, the abundance uh, of F chi, uh, uh, but if alpha dark is uh, large, I'm going to uh, assume that F chi is small and I'm going to actually uh, take it as uh, as a, as a, as a really small uh, parameter. 
then there are no indirect limits, no energy injection and so on, because the, the those are scaling as F chi squared and that's uh, not going to, to do much if F chi is small. Uh, but then on the other hand, the standard visible dark photon uh, constraints apply. And here's the, the, uh, the plot from the recent updates that uh, uh, Gail and Frankie put together. And so we are going to be interested in this corner of the parameter space where you see a lot of action. And um, uh, over there, I argue the formation of bound states is possible. So if you uh, write an, uh, just a potential uh, mediated by this uh, uh, mixed propagator, so the previous diagram that I've shown uh, before with the photon and dark photon mixing, you put it in a T-channel and that uh, for non-relativistic particles gives, uh, gives basically uh, a Yukawa force between the uh, point-like uh, protons and electrons and the chi particle. QI here is uh, plus minus one. Uh, in an atomic setting, the protons are of course incorporated inside the nucleus. So, uh, well, finite radius, but um, sort of if I uh, put the radius to, to, uh, to uh, zero, then I, I would, most of my main interaction would be a Yukawa potential between the dark photo, uh, between the dark matter and, uh, and the nucleus. Uh, mediated by the dark photon and that's a Yukawa force. All right, so uh, there's a lot known about the, the binding due to the Yukawa force. We can uh, take uh, uh, sort of uh, what's known in the literature or better we solve it all numerically. The parameter that enters here is not exactly the same epsilon as before. It's epsilon times the, the geometric mean on alpha and alpha dark. And since I prefer to factor out alpha, there is a parameter epsilon effective, which is basically epsilon times the square root of alpha dark over alpha. And uh, if I push this parameter alpha dark to one, uh, which is not excluded, uh, then, then you get maybe a, ten, a factor of 10 larger epsilon effective than epsilon. Uh, so for this, this choice, fiducial choice of parameters that I've shown before, the, the two things are important. Elastic scattering cross section on nuclei is large and strong enough attractive for, uh, force uh, uh, allows for existence of bound states. So uh, if you just, uh, uh, oh, uh -huh. put um, uh, the, the mediator mass to zero for, 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 for sake of discussion, you get, uh, for example, a binding uh, at uh, epsilon effective of 10 minus three and the reduced mass of 100 GV, you get the binding in the a range of uh, sort of eight KV. But uh, uh, when you put a minimum mass of 10 MeV, because uh, below it's excluded by all various uh, beam dump constraints and um, uh, the realistic uh, nuclear radius, you get actually 2.6 KV. And for all attuned uh, to this uh, um, uh, xenon excess, that, uh, that is already sounding like, like a good energy. Uh, so here is the picture of the bound state uh, wave function and uh, it's sort of uh, for this choice of parameters uh, concentrated uh, in, uh, in the radius of uh, uh, 30 Fermi from, uh, from the center and that's, uh, uh, that's a bit larger than the size of the nucleus, okay. Um, very well, so uh, also importantly, of course, because of mu here and the Z, the binding to, uh, to uh, uh, heavier elements uh, may be possible while binding to light elements may not be. And here is the curves of marginal stability and there is a lot of uh, parameter space in terms of epsilon effective where the binding to xenon is possible while uh, binding to something like silicon which is the dominant say element on the way from the, from the atmosphere to the, to, uh, to the underground lab uh, is not possible. So th this, this, is a, this is a distinct possibility. Uh, if, uh, if so, uh, if the binding is possible, you can have an, a nucleus plus the chi uh, 
state forming a bound state and uh, uh, releasing some energy, right? So this is the, uh, the interesting part because that process can occur even if chi does not have any kinetic energy whatsoever. So uh, the, the uh, bound state uh, formation uh, also requires that the elastic cross sections are very large, right? So even if you use the, uh, the uh, kind of uh, perturbative formula, uh, you arrive to the bound state, uh, sorry, to the elastic scattering range between the nuclei and, uh, and the, uh, uh, this, this type of WIMP to, to uh, uh, at, uh, basically in the strong interaction range. Uh, and that means that there is a fast uh, uh, thermalization. So uh, the typical energy for uh, a 500 uh, for a TV mass uh, WIMP uh, uh, you know, outside will be uh, something like uh, 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 500 kV, but once it enters the atmosphere and, ex uh, and the rock and experience a few collisions, its uh, distribution uh, uh, shrinks in terms of the velocity to, uh, to a very small values corresponding to thermal energy of uh, 300 uh, kelvins. Uh, so the, 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 uh, uh, the distribution becomes a lot uh, squeezed and you cannot uh, see it via uh, direct detection. Um, now, uh, there is a traffic jam effect that we discussed before. So, and, I, uh, and that is effect of uh, sort of increasing the number densities and over densities. So if you have an incoming particle and it enters the, the, the uh, say the earth, right? So there is a rapid thermalization and uh, after which the, the particle starts uh, uh, going, undergoing the, the diffusional process, which is biased by gravity and for, for particles heavier than uh, say uh, 10 or 15 GeV, the particle starts sinking uh, uh, rather efficiently to the, to, uh, to the center of the earth, but there is uh, uh, this, this progress is slow uh, and uh, is determined by the uh, you know, uh, gravitational forcing and the, the uh, effective viscosity provided by the transport cross section. So if you open uh, volume nine or 10 of Landau Lipschitz, this is one of the first formulae you, you will find there. Uh, very well, so what does it mean for, for WIMPs? Uh, for um, uh, the, the, the typical velocity changes from uh, 10 to the seven centimeters per second to uh, 10 centimeters per second, the, the diffusional drift, uh, sorry, the, the, the constant drift down and that, uh, gives the enhancement of by say six orders of magnitude uh, compared to, to a small a small concentrations outside. So you may start from a small F chi, but, but the, the, the matter, uh, you know, helps you to, 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 uh, uh, to uh, increase its uh, uh, density and it's nothing here but the flux conservation. And the below 10 GV, you also have an upward going flux. So, so it, it, in some sense, in that case, the, the enhancement is even larger. Very well. So here is the possible scenario for direct detection, including uh, xenon excess. So let's take small enough F chi so that the surface and balloon experiments are not sensitive. Um, uh, then uh, the main uh, body of the dark matter experiments is not sensitive as well because it is a thermalized particle at that point. Um, there is a density enhancement. That's a traffic jam, as I described. Uh, it, it becomes, in, uh, particles becomes invisible to elastic scattering. Uh, no, uh, uh, no bound states with light elements, let's assume that. No efficient capture during the sinking. Um, and then uh, there can be an efficient capture in experiment, experiment containing heavy enough elements uh, such as xenon, iodine, thallium, for example, right? So you get, uh, you get that process going. And the main signal is the electron-like monoenergetic energy release uh, and uh, possible non-trivial time structure, but I don't have uh, time to talk about that. 
So uh, just to convince you that there are a lot of parameter space where the, the, there is a binding to heavy elements and not the binding to the light. I, I, I show this, this uh, representative curves uh, where dashed is the, the uh, corresponds to a possibility to light, uh, a binding to, to uh, elements lighter than iron and uh, everything is tuned to be uh, at uh, uh, 2.5 kV binding in xenon. Now, the in interesting and the important part is the capture process. We believe that the capture process occurs in the Auger style uh, uh, process. So the atom encounters the uh, slow going uh, WIMP uh, or whatever I should call, be calling it, Kai, uh, and um, uh, basically uh, the bound state would correspond to uh, an object with a larger uh, effective radius because the, the nucleus is being slashed around the, say, a heavy, heavy chi. Uh, and then uh, that in itself uh, is enough for the, uh, for the electron to notice this and get unbound. So that, that, is, that is the, uh, because the electron visits the nucleus very rarely, this is actually a, a calculable using the perturbation theory. So in this, uh, I'm just going to say a few words about this calculation. In the standard uh, Fermi formula uh, with, with, the, with the perturbation uh, here, uh, we, we basically expand over the small nuclear radius uh, and the second term of expansion contains the nuclear radius squared times the Laplacian of the of the of the uh, uh, basically uh, uh, potential for 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 electrons, which uh, basically uh, close the delta function, and uh, and this is uh, this uh, this translates into an operator. Uh, uh, be, uh, relative distance between n and chi that makes the transition between the continuum and the bound state. And it also gives an operator, then the other part of the operator gives a transition between the uh, uh, S-wave bound state electron and the outgoing uh, S-wave electron. So going through estimates, uh, you can arrive to, uh, to a formula that contains a, a high power of inverse uh, MV uh, or MA prime here for me, uh, uh, which uh, is uh, normalized on a sort of uh, characteristic uh, momentum of electrons uh, uh, inside an atom. And there is a bunch of uh, 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 radial integrals that we calculate numerically. And so you arrive to the estimate of the cross section at the level of 10 uh, of the capture rate, sorry, 10 to minus 33 centimeters squared times C. And uh, since C over V is uh, 10 to the six, that's the diffusional kind of uh, value. The actual cross, uh, cross section is 10 to minus 27 centimeters squared and it's uh, not tiny. So here is the, the breakdown of uh, uh, a possibility of, for event rate for xenon one ton. Uh, if bound states are formed, um, um, you know, we can translate the reco electron recoil sensitivity to extreme sensitivity to F chi, not to the cross section because it's fixed, but to F chi. So uh, taking a 500 GV ma uh, mass uh, uh, chi with, uh, uh, which gives a, a, a 100 GV kind of uh, 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 reduced mass, one gets the thermal uh, sort of uh, uh, velocity of, of 10 over four centimeters per second and the sinking velocity is, uh, is 10 centimeters per, se per second. So the traffic jam enhanced uh, density is, uh, uh, 10 to the three per cubic centimeter and the rate, uh, counting rate in xenon uh, uh, will be uh, five times 10 to the 15 times F chi per ton per year. And that translate, uh, given the, the sort of the, the exclusions that uh, 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 xenon publishes, this translates to uh, sensitivity to F chi as good as 10 to minus 14 and uh, the, uh, this, the next best probes are uh, balloons that are perhaps 10 orders of magnitude away. So uh, this is the, I don't know how to call it, rarity frontier, if you like. 
So uh, the and of course at the borderline you can uh, you can explain the the uh, uh, the excess as well. All right. So I uh, since I started maybe a minute or two later. I'm going to take one or two minutes with with uh, with Andreas's permission. So now <laughs> putting putting <laughs> this together onto epsilon MA prime parameter space, zooming into this corner that I showed you before and uh, choosing the, the, uh, the binding in xenon to be uh, from two to three kV range, we can plot the, uh, the, the bands where the, the, the explanation of the xenon excess is possible. So this is a five TV particle it will bind to, to a xenon nucleus with this uh, with this parameters and give that much energy release, which is consistent with the excess. And of course, uh, the, the main uncertainty in our game is we don't know alpha dark in this in this in this uh, in this game. And uh, so, uh, being uh, rather uh, liberal about it, uh, we can say that the whole corner here. Uh, um, uh, is is allowed for bound states, and this is uh, roughly defines a triangle that is roughly uh, um, allowing everything to alpha dark order one. This is uh, roughly one decade long on each uh, each diagonal of the triangle where the bound states are possible and the the xenon excess should it be uh, proved to be real, uh, it could be ex explained this way. And I should say that hopefully this this corner uh, would could be explored in the next installment of LHCB and HPS experiments, perhaps. Um, I'll skip that because I'm out of time. So I conclude that um, direct detection experiments uh, are, are sensitive not only to main components of dark matter but also to very very subdominant dark matter species. Uh, usual blind spot thermalized dark matter component uh, may be detected uh, by the bound state formation if it's possible. And to, I should say, mu much of my surprise that in the very popular model with the dark photons uh, and the mixing angle of 10 minus 3, the, the, the uh, and a sizable alpha dark, the, the formation of dark, uh, dark bound states with nuclei is indeed occurring. And uh, the uh, a very representative value of the binding is in the KV range, which is uh, which is uh, quite nice because uh, then it gives you an opportunity to uh, explore anything from the binding energies of a few EV to to KV using very very large detectors and clean detectors such as xenon uh, one ton. And uh, since the binding of heavier elements uh, is far more likely the sort of the uh, capture on the way to, to, to a detector does not necessarily have to occur and it, it can uh, lead to a, a, a interesting signature of monoenergetic electron-like events. And so uh, uh, we estimate that the xenon one ton uh, is sensitive to abundances as, as low, uh, of such particles as low as 10 minus 14. And uh, this is uh, um, a new direction, uh, if you like, uh, a rarity frontier. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Maxine, for this nice uh, uh, talk. So the floor is open for, for questions. So that there was Beth, who was asking, who was raising the hand? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I be, yes, we hear you. Okay, great. Um, my question, if I understood correctly, at the beginning you said that the uh, initial and only at the one common denominator was a uh, kept scale dark photon. Is that, is that correct? Is that understand that correct? Huh? Could you repeat it, please? Sorry, I didn't get it. So at the beginning, if I understand correctly, you said that the initial explanation of the xenon-1 anomaly was a kept scale dark photon. There, there could be very many explanations, right? Uh, including like experimental backgrounds and stuff. Uh, 
So we are, we are trying to make, uh, explain it by formation of bond states and the release of corresponding. Okay. Because my, my question was going to be, uh, if, there's a, if there's a curve scale bug, for example, and then there are other experimental motivations, for example, the, the beryllium anomaly from a well, there is a, There is a beryllium anomaly. Unfortunately, it cannot be explained within the dark photon model itself because uh, this is... Um, uh, uh, it will be an excluded parameter space, so you would have to um, do some theoretical manipulations to a model to allow a more energetic binding to 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 uh, 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 to uh, variance uh, to uh, the, the interaction with the nuclei. But yes, the 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 mass scale for the anomaly seventeen MeV is like. Okay. Spot on for the for the for the discussion I'm having. Yes. Okay. Okay. But it would be a different type of possible. Yeah. It, I mean, like, unfortunately, there are no good models. That's that's a bit of a. Uh, it's my opinion, right? So okay. some people may have a different opinion. Yeah. Here, here. Um, I have a naive question. So these bound states wouldn't they be fairly stable? Yes, they will be very stable. Yes, a good question. You can, uh, the next question, let me anticipate your question. Do you, do you have like probes via, via the uh, uh, rare isotopes and so on? And the answer is like the, 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 in one year, the, the xenon one ton experiment had, uh, you know, uh, 50 event excess uh, and uh, you can multiply it by a billion years and you will find out that, okay, maybe a few captures happens with, with, within one gram of xenon, but this is far, far away from the uh, uh, rare isotope probes for very heavy elements, okay? Okay, thanks. I think we have to, to stop here so the further questions can oh, be Ryan has, a, Ryan has a question. Yeah, that's okay, Maxime. I'll ask you later. <laughs> no, but, no, but sorry, we are really yes. out of time. I mean, we didn't we, we can put it on this on, in, in the Slack. In the Slack, in the Slack channel, you can channel continue discussing. We didn't yeah. cut any minute from you. So, sorry, but let's thank uh, Maxime again for his uh, nice talk. Yeah. And we proceed to the PhD forum. So the first, uh, the first uh, speaker will be will be Bonilla Jesus. And Hello, everyone. Yeah. Do you hear me? Okay. Yes, we hear you. Please. please. Uh, you can see my slides, right? Yes. <clears throat> okay. And then I start. You can start. Okay. Yes, please. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Jesus Bonilla. And for this talk, I'm going to talk about one loop corrections to the action of the particle effective Lagrange. This is part of a work that I'm doing with my supervisor, Belen Gabella, in collaboration with Laria Brivia and Veronica Sam. First of all, let me define what an action of the particle is. These are still the Goldstone bosons that couples with the standard model particles be either derivative operators or anomalous operators for the interaction with the gauge fields. And thus, the parameter space is defined in terms of its mass and its energy scale. Okay. Uh, and also, axial particles are relevant because so the Goldstone bosons are typical of many beyond standard model theories, for example, the axion or the majorons. Okay. Uh, next question is why do we care about these one loop corrections? There are several reasons. One of them is that now the experiments uh, have reached enough precision to start looking for these one corrections. Another reason is that now uh, actually particles are being tracked at very different energies, in particular at collider energies in which they can interact with heavy bosons. Yet another reason is that with this computation, uh, we can derive new experimental bounds on the parameter space. Um, for this work, we have used a dimension five linear effective Lagrangian, that is this one, with the anomalous interactions and derivative coupling to the standard model right-handed fermions. We have further clarified with the computation of the explicit expressions that additional operators like this one and others, for example, the chirality flipping operators, are redundant, and therefore our Lagrangian is already a complete basis. 
Moreover, the first two terms of this Lagrangian, uh, splitting to the coupling to the physical bits bosons after electroisometry breaking, and these are not linearly independent. They have to satisfy these relations at three level that comes directly from gauging values. Now with this Lagrangian and all these, uh, all these couplings, we have computed all the one loop corrections to each coupling constant that comes from uh, all these Feynman diagrams at one loop. Um, for this computation, we have assumed the standard model legs to be on-shell, but we have allowed the action, the action like particles, sorry, to be off-shell. Uh, previous works already computed a small fraction of these diagrams under the normalization group equation, but it is the first time that this computation is done for all the couplings, including all the finite terms, and also for off-shell algorithms, which is relevant, for example, for non-resonant um, searches. Here, I'm not going to show you the complete results because the, the expressions are huge for the amplitudes. But let me show you one example. That is the correction to the electron interaction induced by the interaction with the top quark, uh, which is relevant, for example, for some experiments like xenon. And this correction is given by this second term in this expression, and it's proportional to m top squared. So if for some reason the three-level coupling is uh, suppressed, it can dominate the interaction, okay? And therefore we can uh, take the actual bounds on the electron interaction and apply them to the, and, and derive new bounds on the, and the actual particle top quark interaction. Also in, in our work, we computed how the gauge invariant relations are modified when we go to the one loop level by these ordered alpha terms. And these relations are important because they can be used in a similar way to the previous example to derive new bounds on the parameter space. And now these bounds are modified by these order alpha terms, okay? Um, well, that is all for this talk. Uh, as a conclusion, I just want to remind you that now the experimental precision is enough. It requires the computation of these corrections for some couplings, for instance, the, the photon-photon interaction. Uh, also that, this computation, uh, this, this um, corrections is the first time that are derived, including all the finite terms. And also that our results are relevant for experimental searches. Uh, for example, in particular, they are important for non-resonant and searches at colliders. And here I showed you one example that is the ALP mediated diversion production at LHC. And this is something we are also working on right now. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, if you have any question, please ask me. Uh, and if you are further interested in this topic, please check my poster. Thank you. Thank you very much. So are there, is there a question? I have just one on the, on the next to last slide. You have, see, you have seen the improvements or, or this recasting of the bounds. Mm -hmm. They seem to be quite, so, so quite stronger than the previous, than these green, greenish bounds, uh, which you got by gauge invariance. How, how could you- Okay, this, this is just an example. The, the original bound that I've with these relations is uh, in this work that yeah. corresponds to the red line. Yeah. Um, and uh, now if we take this bound with this correction, we have compute how this line moves. But it's really it, two orders of magnitude better. No, but this is just an example. This is a, we, ah. we didn't compute exactly how it is corrected. The original work was done at three level here. Ah, okay. And is the, the red line. The ah, red. Okay, yeah, okay. But now this red line can move, can be shifted when we add these order alpha terms. This is just an example. The, the darker one is just an example. Thank you. Thank you very, Thank much. You very much. So we proceed to the next uh, uh, talk. You, you just introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Alfredo Guerrero. I'm gonna show, time. Yes, I'm gonna show you what I'm, what I'm working on. Yes, we hear you. See the screen. You know, see your screen. Slide. Yes. Okay. So uh, I'm going to show you my uh, talk on uh, revisiting the Kegel pi of uh, decay. Uh, this is uh, something I'm working on with uh, Stefano Rigorin uh, from the University of Padua and NFM. So we're interested in axion like particles in flavor physics, uh, mainly because of uh, the importance that they have in DSM models, where you can uh, easily generate them. And uh, if you have at least a global U1 symmetry, which is spontaneously broken at some high scale, let's say, higher than, uh, the, uh, than the weak scale. 
the inclusion uh, also of uh, some the small uh, direct symmetry breaking parameter, uh, like uh, the bare mass of the ALP, can lead to some PNGB, which is very light with respect to the new physics scale. You can think of this uh, uh, very similar uh, effect as uh, what we have in GCD carrel symmetry breaking, where you have some of this spectrum at, uh, say, the lambda GCD scale, and then you have pions, which are light uh, PNGBs. And this is the same as uh, you want BS, BSM symmetry breaking, where you have an energy scale physics at FA, and then you get the uh, ALPS as uh, pseudorandom Gaussian bosons. For the low energy effective theory, uh, we use uh, a very simple Lagrangian, where we take uh, the um, up to five dimensional uh, couplings of the ALP with the standard model fermions, where you can see here, they uh, couple derivatively. And uh, we introduce three by three general emission matrices uh, that uh, couple directly to the flavor, tri to the, to the flavor tri uh, triplet. So, uh, once uh, we introduce the minimal flavor evolution and ansatz, uh, we can uh, uh, simplify the model and just take off all the diagonal terms requiring that uh, you don't have uh, no flavor, uh, you don't have flavor violation at three level, and you just skip the um, uh, six couplings to the, to the fermions of the standard models at low energy. And typically, when we think about K2 pi DK, we usually think about the loops uh, that uh, dominate the, um, the contribution via the, the top enhancement. Uh, this is true uh, almost uh, always. Uh, at least when you keep uh, just one coupling for all the for all the fermions. If you instead uh, take uh, different couplings for the fermions, you can have uh, a three-level interaction, which is significant, which is significant uh, just by the nature of the interaction itself. In particular, for charged uh, for the charged signal, you get uh, uh, this kind of diagram uh, where uh, you have an S exchange. Uh, of the W boson for the, um, and the emission can be uh, uh, done by the initial state uh, meson or by the final state meson. While for the neutral uh, uh, three-level diagrams, you have this kind of diagrams. And again, you can have uh, an initial uh, emission or a final uh, state emission of, uh, of the ALP. Once we set up uh, our theory, we can uh, start computing stuff, uh, which, is, which, which is always interesting, by using the MFB Lagrangian, and in particular, uh, uh, choosing a ground state wave function for the meson. We can hadronize uh, the amplitudes and uh, compute uh, the relevant uh, contribution of the three level. In particular, we see that the, the important ones are the charged uh, three level diagrams, while the neutral will get uh, uh, suppressed by uh, the fact that we are measuring, uh, for example, k, k0 long to pi 0, which is uh, pi 0 alpha, which needs uh, to be a CP violation. And uh, it, it will get uh, ten, a factor of 10 to the minus 3 uh, in front. So it will get uh, squished in, uh, in, the, in, in the signal. So the important, uh, uh, the important part of the amplitude is the first one we see here, which is proportional to t plus. As, uh, as you can see, uh, the, the part uh, proportional to uh, the mass of the pion will get uh, uh, suppressed. And also, in general, if you have a, light, uh, a lighter uh, uh, mass and emitting, uh, its uh, function uh, g of pi of x will, will be zero in, uh, in general. I'm going to show you quickly some of the results that uh, we're working with. We have the new NI62 data. Uh, which is very promising. On the, on the left, you see uh, a bound derived only from the three levels. So it's, so it's not very impressive, but this is uh, on the light quartz uh, couplings. So um, of the ALP with the, uh, with the fermion. So it's, uh, it's interesting. While on the, on the right, you have the solid lines, which represent the, just the loop uh, contribution. And the bands in pink and uh, cyan represents the uh, variation that you get by including the, the C down coupling in the measure, which is uh, quite significant. This is uh, this band of confidence is used uh, when C down varies, uh, say, between, between minus 0 0.2 and 0 0.2. Lastly, I'm going to show you some correlation graphs that we have for the measures. On the left, we have zero mass, and on the right, we have 0.2 GeV. 
and the, the solid blue line and the, the blue shaded area is bounded by the k 2 pi half charged. And then you have the neutral uh, k long pi zero and uh, the code expected lines. Um, we have also, if we have a uh, maximum signal cancellation, which is uh, get, uh, which you get with the minus sign on the amplitude. Okay, I'm done here. <laughs> the, um, uh, the references, and if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to ask. Thank you very much. One urgent question. So you can always ask in the in the Slack, in the Slack channel and. Uh, I, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Very well, much. Thank you very much Bye. for your talk, and we proceed to the next speaker. Yes, I think that's me. Can you all see me and hear me? We hear you. Okay. And we see. And do I see you? I don't know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, now we see. <laughs> Now you can see the slides. Now, now you will see you and see the slides. Perfect. <laughs> okay, oh, then perfect. I'm going to start. Yes. Uh, you introduce yourself. Uh, yes, wait a second. Ah, okay. <laughs> now I'm going to start. Uh, yes, so hi everyone. And thank you so much for having me here in the PhD forum at the Invisibles workshop. I am now going to introduce you to my current research project, which deals with dark matter as a pseudonumber Goldson boson and its interactions with talk quarks. So we study a set of generic operators that are relevant in models in which dark matter arises as a pseudonumber Goldson boson or PNGB for short from some broken global symmetry at high energies. There we distinguish two different kinds of interactions. Um, first, operators which couple dark matter to the standard model Higgs via uh, derivatives or directly. And second, we have interactions of dark matter with the standard model fermions. The latter either scale with the standard model Yukawa couplings or couple via derivatives as well. The F in front of the dimension six operators denotes the energy scale of the breaking of the global symmetry. So, PNGP models for dark matter are interesting from a model building perspective since they can both explain dark matter and solve the hierarchy problem, assuming a suitable composite Higgs model. And these kinds of models have a yeah, increase in popularity since the most naive WIMP scenarios are very strongly constrained by direct detection experiments. And since the interaction of dark matter with the light standard model fermions is either Yukawa suppressed or momentum suppressed, one would expect these models to be less constrained by direct detection. On the other hand, the scaling with the Yukawa couplings uh, suggests an investigation of the interactions of dark matter with top quarks. And this is what we are interested in in our project. Uh, okay. ah, so let's consider some phenomenologically interesting processes. First, we could think of producing dark matter along with top quarks at a collider like the LHC. We would expect to observe deviations from the standard model in the TT plus MET or TW plus MET channels, which are investigated by the ATLAS and CMS collaborations for different final states. We have implemented four of these uh, searches into Checkmate in order to compute the collider bounds for PNGB dark matter. Another bound we get from precision physics that colliders would be invisible Higgs decays. Here you see a diagram in the unbroken electroweak phase of the standard model, which leads to contributions to the decay width of the standard model Higgs boson after electroweak symmetry breaking. And of course, the operators we consider also give rise to tree level contributions via the marginal and derivative Higgs portals. But loop processes like the one shown here uh, also give us sensitivity to the Yukawa and the current current type interactions with fermions. And now regarding direct detection, um, you can couple the PNGB dark matter to the U1 hypercharged gauge boson of the standard model, which induces electromagnetic scatterings with atomic nuclei or via top quark loops or quark loops in general, you can couple the dark matter with SU3 field strengths such that the dark matter can interact with the gluons inside nuclei. Both these diagrams turn out to give very strong exclusion bounds from direct detection. 
regarding indirect detection, we consider the annihilation of dark matter pairs into pairs of photons, which can also be mediated via top quark loops. The dark matter relic abundance is set by pair annihilations into heavy quarks, gauge bosons, or Higgs bosons, depending on the dark matter mass. Um, now let's have a look at some preliminary results. So here we have only considered the derivative Higgs portal operator to be non-zero. And you see an exclusion plot with the dark matter mass on the x-axis and the symmetry breaking scale on the y-axis. We see that if kinematically allowed, a, um, a large region of the parameter space is ruled out due to invisible Higgs decays for small dark matter masses, which is this light green domain. Um, the gray band in the plot is the constraint from indirect, indirect detection, that is gamma ray spectra from dwarf spheroidal galaxies. And now for larger dark matter masses, we see that the only way to probe PNGB dark matter are collider searches like this orange domain that you can see, which stems from TX plus MET searches. However, the constraints we find are by far not strong enough to exclude models which also explain the dark matter relic abundance, which is realized along this um, dark green line. And direct detection experiments are not sensitive to this uh, derivative Higgs portal operator. However, if we add, for instance, the Yukawa type interaction with fermions, this changes. All the other bounds uh, remain somewhat similar, but the direct detection constraint dominates the collider constraint up to the TEV mass scale. And still, the sensitivity is not strong enough to test whether PNGB dark matter explains the relic abundance. So in conclusion, according to our analysis, PNGB dark matter still remains an interesting candidate to explain the dark matter puzzle and to solve the hierarchy problem. And for more information, you can have a look at my poster and ask questions via Slack, or wait for the upcoming publication together with Uli Haish and Giacomo Pulisello. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. So I propose to proceed immediately to the next talk. Hi. Hello. Can you hear me? There is a yeah. question. Uh, ah, OK. I think. So yeah, Michele, Michele Frigerio has uh, his hand raised. If I can, yeah. Uh, so yeah. wondering whether there is a simple reason why um, at colliders is associated search, I mean, associated the uh, top production, the main constraint, and not things like monojet plus missing DT. Uh, in fact, monojet searches are also interesting, and we're also looking into that, but it's uh, we're not at the point that I want to present the results ah. in that. Uh, but there are also other constraints like in the VBF channel that uh, test these kinds of models, yes. But uh, right, thank you. monojets are still a work in progress. Oh, yeah, thank you. Okay, Maria? Yes, hi. Hi. Um, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, so can I start? Yes, please. Yes. So thanks a lot for having me. Uh, I will continue the discussion about uh, dark matter in the case in which it can emerge as a pseudo gold sun from an extended global symmetry along with a Higgs boson. Uh, so this scenario can arise as we heard in composite Higgs models. Um, and in this case, the dark matter mass can be generated radiatively by the coupling of heavy fermions uh, of the composite sector to the standard model fermions. And the dark matter mass can be naturally at the electric scale. Um, and in this work, I have focused on anomaly free models such as the SO7 to SO6 model in which you actually produce extra degrees of freedom. In this case, uh, we consider an extra uh, pseudoscalar singlet on top of, of our dark matter candidate eta. Uh, and we wanted to study the case in which this kappa can be lighter than the dark matter and therefore affect its phenomenology non-trivially. Uh, and for that, we have basically compared two regimes which can arise depending on how, we trans how the standard model fermions are embedded into the global symmetry. So in regime one, we can actually predict that the portal coupling to the Higgs is order 0.1, while the portal coupling to the exotic pseudoscalar will be subleading. Uh, and we will also be able to predict the new physics scale F as a function of the masses. 
Uh, however, if we go into smaller representations, as in the case uh, of regime two, we lose some predictability, but we can actually accommodate, have freedom to accommodate the inverse case. So in this case, we will be try trying to probe the uh, dark matter portal coupling to the exotic singlet. Uh, so let us start sketching the phenomenology first at the annihilation scale. So as we just heard, we have these new derivative interactions, which are important, and they can partially cancel out the effect of the portal couplings. So for instance, uh, you can see for intermediate dark matter masses, a regime of overabundance. And this is what I'm showing you here in green for one of the cases. Uh, and along this line, our, our candidate Eta here near 200 GeV can actually explain the totality of relic density that we observe while annihilating sizably to the, to the exotic particle that we have introduced. And just a remark that in our most predictive regime, we can actually use this constraint. So when we have the, when we predicted the protocol up into the Higgs to set a bound on a new physics scale in the scenario that we want to study dark matter. So moving on to direct detection. Um, so in, again, in the regime where we have this, this portal coupling to the Higgs, we have uh, an important uh, contribution to the dark matter cross-section scattering of a nucleus. And this is already being probed by xenon one ton, and this is what I'm showing you in the plot of the left. But on the other hand, when we have the other regime where we can study the dominant contribution coming from the coupling to the pseudoscalar, we have a loop suppressed cross-section. So in the end, this is the scalar contribution that you see here. Uh, and this can actually evade even the projected bounds provided by the LZ, collab LZ collaboration. So we need to study further probes, namely at indirect detection. And here we have an important effect because we are introducing an intermediate step in the, in the annihilation. So this will double the number of final state particles of the standard model after the annihilation. And so we cannot just, we have to do new simulation to obtain the new spectra basically. So I'm showing you here an example for prompt gamma rays um, for different decay channels of our new particle. And the main effect that we observe in comparison to the direct dark matter annihilation into standard model particles, which I show in blue, um, is that we, we observe a shift of the spectra to the left due to this larger number of particles in the final state. So then using this as input, we can figure out uh, basically the new indirect detection bounds by recasting the results of Fermilat, for instance. And this is what I show you on the plot of the right. Uh, and we find that, for instance, in the leptophilic regime of kappa, uh, for, uh, when it goes to muons, for example, these uh, final states are very weakly constrained and they can be actually the, 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 the most affected by the introduction of this uh, intermediate step in annihilation. So this really motivates, um, motivates us to look into other probes such as those at colliders. Um, and for that, I have studied pair production of vector-like quarks, which are really the smoking gun uh, signal of compositeness and try to probe their non-minimal decays into this extra pseudoscalar. Um, and I, I analyzed the prospects for a future 100 TeV collider because per, pair production drops sharply with the mass. And I can tell you, for instance, when this system of kappa kappa goes into four muons, we can really reach uh, uh, these vector-like quark masses up to nine TeV, which means we can really probe these new physics scales uh, up to that mass. So in the end, to conclude, we really find an important complementarity between these dark matter searches and possible future collider ones. And that's all uh, I'll leave you with my conclusions. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Maria. Is there an urgent question? Apparently not. So let's go to the, to, to the last talk of the PhD forum. Okay, so you Are can you hear me. Kira? Yes. yes, we hear you. Okay, let me share the screen. Okay, you can see my slide? Yes. Okay, so... You can start. Okay, so thanks. So today we talk about the project that in coalition with Jan Kutanu and Jordan Savant. So it is about parameter correlation wave that could be reviewed by the effect of spinning axion. Okay, so in the future, we have many experiments that could probe the fraction of energy density in gravitational waves today in many frequency range. And from the theoretical point of view, 
one should expect the most conservative stochastic signal coming from quantum fluctuation during inflation. And this is typically small and could be badly probed by any of this ex experiment. But still, the spectrum span a broad range of frequencies, and we can use this to trace the evolution of the universe from high to low frequency direction. So now this spectrum has a nice flat shape. This is due to the assumption that we have the standard model of radiation era from the Big Bang Megosynthesis scale up to inflationary scale. However, this might not be true because in many interesting particle physics models, one can generate the non-standard cosmical history. And I would like to show here one of this case. So if we have the matter era that happened at some intermediate scale and followed by the so-called kinetian era. So if we, if we have this modified cosmical history, the Kinesian spectrum, we get this thought into a peak shape like this. So matter era, we generate a red tilt on a spectrum, while kinetian era will enhance the spectrum and make it blue tilt. So we have, we have the peak Kinesian spectrum that could be probed and have a nice feature in the future observatories. Okay, now another interesting story is that this kind of modified cosmical history can be generated naturally in a model where we have spinning axion. So what is spinning axion? So it is just an axion and we go beyond the usual assumption that we have axion just sit and frozen on the potential. So now axion will have some initial velocity and this is very generic in a model that has the so-called kinetic misalignment mechanism, such as the axogenesis model or the trap misalignment that I think we will hear later today by Pablo. So now in this talk, just we, I will just focus on the example of exogenesis type of model. So we start with the pressure queen scalar field, the complex scalar field that has the angular mode as axion. So the field will sit on top of the potential and at some point it will start to oscillate. And the axion, the angular mode will be kicked by some opposite breaking term that only effective at early time. So now if we oscillate into a direction, the radio direction and angular direction, and it will obtain the elliptic orbit like this. And at later time, this scalar field can interact with some other field, but by charge conservation, one can show that only the radio motion will be damped. So we were left with the axion that's still spinning and has this circular orbit. So now up to this point, the field will behave like matter and could generate matter era. And then later on, the the orbit will redshift down the potential to do Hubble friction, but axon is still spinning with some large kinetic energy and it could dominate the universe and it will generate the so-called kinetian era. So now after kinetian era happen, it will last until the standard model radiation becomes dominant again at some low energy scale. So the modified cosmic history will look like this. So we have radiation era, matter era, kinetian, and then another radiation era. So to understand the constraint spectrum, we can trace this back, trace this evolution back in time. So we have radiation era here. So at low frequency here, we have flat part coming from radiation era. And then we have blue tilt from kinetian. Then we have red tilt from matter era. And then again, at high frequency, we have the flat part coming from radiation era at some high energy scale. So basically we can generate a peak constraint spectrum due to the spinning axion. And this peak frequency and the peak, we have frequency corresponding to the kinetian energy scale, square root m, the mass of radio mode times the FA. And the amplitude will get enhanced more and more by the longer and longer kinetian era. So for the next generation Grenchel F experiment, Einstein telescope can probe 10 to the 8 GV scale kinetian, while LISA can probe TV scale. OK, so to summarize, the kinetian era can amplify the conscious spectrum coming from the primary source. For example, inflationary conscious spectrum get Bluetooth. And the kinetian can be naturally occur in a model with the spinning axion. However, in this case, we also have matter era that come first before kinetian. And in the end, the conscious spectrum get distorted into a peak shape like this and could be interesting observable signature in the future observatories. And before closing, I would like to refer you to a poster by Philip Solensen where he discussed the diameter production from this kind of model. Okay, so thank you. Thank you, Pira. 
So is there an urgent question, Shapira? That's not the case, So, but let's thank Pira and all the speakers in the PhD forum. And we continue to, to, the, to the talk by, by Chanda. So, but before, before we start with the talk, and she, she can, in any case, prepare already everything, I, I remind you that after, after her talk, there will, be the, 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 there will be the photo of the conference be done. And so, uh, please, uh, at the end, so stay, stay, of course, <laughs> until the end, uh, uh, and switch your cameras on for this for this event. Then, but I will remind again at the end. So, so we are happy to have uh, to have uh, Chanda now, and she will talk about imprints of invisible axions on structure formation. So, please, you have the floor. Yeah. So everyone can hear me. Yes, yes, we hear you. Okay, good. Yes. Um, so I want to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me. And also I want to congratulate the graduate students and all giving really lovely talks in yes. the PhD session. I really en enjoyed all of them and I learned some things. So thank you. Um, so I, I am also going to talk about axions. I realize actually that the title I sent in didn't make that clear, but um, more <laughs> axions. Axions are awesome. Um, the papers that I'm going to reference, the archive numbers are also on the slides, but I just wanted to give people the heads up that there are a few different papers that I'm going to talk about today. Um, so I am going to give you all a sense of what I'm going to talk about through open questions. I was really inspired. Columbia University Astronomy was asking colloquium speakers to address big questions. And I think this is actually a great way for us to think about what is the outline of our talks. So I'm gonna start by going through what cosmological phenomena do we need to understand? I'm gonna say a little bit about the dark matter problem. I love that for this audience, I need to say a lot less than I might need for other audiences. Um, and if the dark matter is the axion, what does that mean for cosmological phenomena? And what techniques should we emphasize as we seek to answer some of these questions? So I'm, um, I'm probably gonna cross over a little bit with some of the talks that you all have already heard, but I think that a lot of the, the talks have emphasized um, direct detection and um, ground-based experiment. And so I'm actually gonna be stepping back and thinking about things from an astrophysical perspective. And so this will maybe be a little bit of a different angle on axions than, than um, some of what we've been hearing so far today. Um, so I just like to remind people that kind of like the big picture question, right, is that we have this cosmological timeline. We know that the universe becomes transparent to, to photons at about 400,000 years, and this is great. Um, we, we have the cosmic microwave background radiation. Um, it has some anisotropies in it. This is now an older, this is from Kobe. So for the young people in the audience, Kobe is before WMAP. Um, but, and this is really the first time that we saw the anisotropies properly. And in some sense, the big cosmological question here is how do we go from this Kobe image to the Spitzer image to this Hubble deep field? So somehow these um, anisotropies are providing us insight into the beginnings of what becomes this Hubble deep field. So the really big picture thing here is we want to understand how does structure form how does it form from these small quantum fluctuations, these one part and 10 to the five fluctuations? And then also, of course, the other question that we're always asking is how much of the stuff is there and how does that shape space-time itself? Um, so importantly, when we, when we talk about uh, dark matter, we have a tendency to talk about um, you know, gravitational lensing and rotation curves when we're thinking about what is the evidence for dark matter. And so it's actually worth reminding people that actually at this point in time, fitting the power spectrum from, for the cosmic microwave background radiation is actually our most um, substantive evidence for the existence of dark matter, that it's very hard to fit the power spectrum without a dark matter component. Um, so that's, that's kind of the bigger cosmological context. And then of course, um, you know, we still want to zoom in this Hubble deep field. If you've never spent time looking at it or the ultra deep field, you're missing out in life. It's one of the most exciting things that you can do in my opinion. So I encourage people who haven't spent time looking at it to look at it. And then of course, if we wanted to, wanted to zoom in on any of these objects, 
one of the questions that we're asking, this is still a very big picture, but much smaller than the deep field, is really about the galaxy halo connection. So sort of the cartoon image that we have in mind of how dark matter is distributed is that we have this visible part of the galaxy, um, but that actually, when we think about a galaxy, the luminous part is really only a very small part of like, you know, 20% or so of, of what's actually there. And so we think that every single um, galaxy, like a Milky Way like galaxy lives in a halo of dark matter. Um, and then that halo also will have sub halos. So that's what these, um, that, that's what's represented by these blue spots. And actually each of those sub halos is going to host its own um, small like um, dwarf galaxy satellite galaxy. And so a galaxy like the Milky Way, for example, has about 60 satellites that we know about. Um, one that you will have heard of is the Large Magellanic Cloud. Uh, for folks who were kind of like, why should the, the Gaia results matter to me? One of the things that was really exciting about the recent Gaia data release is that we can really start to get a sense of how um, the Large Magellanic Cloud is being title stripped by its gravitational interactions with the Milky Way, um, including you know, situating it in context with, with the dark matter halo. And so this is gonna give us some sense of how dark matter is distributed and what role that dark matter is, is playing in that gravitational dynamic. And some of that is gonna be shaped by, for example, does your dark matter form solitons, right? So that's, that's where it becomes relevant. Is it an axion? Is it not an axion? I also just wanna make a comment that one of the kind of big picture questions that we have here is the galaxy halo connection. Um, which is if I give you the mass of the halo, how many sub halos do I expect to form? What is the mass of the luminous part of the galaxy that I expect to form? So there are all of these um, questions that if you spend most of your time on the particle physics side, you might not be aware that there are all of these like kind of detailed questions that we can be asking on the astrophysical side that can potentially be shaped by which dark matter candidate that you're talking about. And so this is kind of, um, this is one of the places where, where my work lives. I also want to zoom into an even smaller scale than this, which is thinking about neutron stars. So I really like neutron stars as, um, a, as they're one of the best particle physics laboratories in the universe. Um, and so what you're looking at is kind of a, a cartoon image that there's a lot that we don't know about neutron stars, including um, you know, what is the equation of state? And depending on the, um, the nuclear physics model that you give for your equation of state, you get different mass radius relations. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about this in part because one of the directions that my work is going in now is trying to understand what happens to the equation of state and observables that give us insight into the equation of state. If for example, there is dark matter that is somehow interacting with the neutron star or even present in the neutron star core. Um, so uh, there's, there's lots of different places that we can look for um, evidence of axions or more broadly scalar dark matter. Um, all right, so let's move on to uh, just some like brief comments about what is the dark matter problem. I have generally speaking, I'm given an overview and I'm really happy I don't have to say much about this to the audience. I just like to remind people that one of the, the things that makes dark matter fun to think about is that it actually gives us real perspective on actually how weird we are, because actually what we call normal matter is actually a very small fraction of what the universe is made of. So humans, we are the weirdos and pretty much everything that we can see is what's weird, right? So dark matter, um, and whatever, I, I actually don't like calling it the dark energy problem. It's the cosmic acceleration problem. Um, whatever is driving cosmic acceleration um, seems to make up most of what, what the universe is. But in some sense, this is the, the, um, the dark matter problem is that we only understand, we have this incredible standard model, but we only understand a very small fraction of it. Um, so, you know, what do we know? We know photon, photons don't interact with it much. Um, particles move slowly. They're not short-lived. 
We know that simulations and data match on large scales. So if you compare the simulation with, say, Sloan Digital Sky Survey data, you see the cosmic web. And we also saw a really beautiful um, uh, dark energy survey um, release uh, last week that gives a really beautiful map of where we think dark matter is. And this matches simulations really nicely on large scales. But we don't know what kind of particle it is. So this is beyond standard model physics, as, as we've all been discussing. Um, just as a reminder, the axion is a particularly interesting dark matter candidate uh, because we need it anyway. So I'm mostly putting the slide here just so people have some orientation to um, I, some of the things that I'm going to talk about in particular. Um, you know, we have this instanton approximation uh, potential for the axion, this cosine potential. Um, Today, when we say the word axion, we often mean more broadly than the QCD axion, which is what I'm showing you on this slide. The key thing is that um, axions or axion-like particles all have these sinusoidal potentials that can be expanded in a Taylor series that you know, goes out to phi to the four or phi to the six, if, if you can convince yourself that that's meaningful. Um, so that's generically what I'm gonna talk about. I say a little bit more about this in, in a moment. I like to remind people of why Ann Nelson said that um, axions were a really compelling uh, dark matter particle. She was my last postdoc advisor and I miss her dearly. So I love bringing her into these talks. Um, it's not only a, a viable theory, right? It hasn't been ruled out, but it's also a natural and elegant theory because it doesn't have the CP violation. The neutron doesn't gain an electric dipole moment if you have the Petchy Quinn mechanism, which is going to give you your axion. Um, so this is a really nice like Venn diagram of why you should find axions to be a particularly compelling um, dark matter candidate. And so I just like to remind people really quickly that you will hear these different terms. And I have found that people are like afraid to ask about what the difference between these terms are unless I, I put the slide up. So I'm gonna put this slide up and I'm gonna say, even if you're at the Invisibles meeting and you feel like you're supposed to know, if you have a question about this, please ask me during the Q&A. So the relic QCD population is the one that comes from the original Petchy Quinn symmetry. We also have what we call axion-like particles, ALPS, ultralight axions, fuzzy dark matter. So these are all particles that have shift symmetries like the axions. So you get that sinusoidal potential. Um, they don't necessarily solve the QCD problem, and they may not even actually make for good dark matter candidates because, for example, they can be too low mass. So they can be as low as 10 to the minus 33 EV. Um, you really need around like 10 to the minus 22 EV to get into viable, this is a dark matter candidate um, territory. But the thing I want you to remember is that they're all scalars with a sinusoidal potential that um, can take the following form if you, you tailor expand it. And um, sometimes people drop the phi to the four term. And so if there's one thing that people take away from this talk, I want people to take away, please don't ignore the phi to the four term. It is your friend and it may actually have a, a, a phenomenological impact. Um, so it's easy to wave that away, but we shouldn't. Um, so if the dark matter is the axion, what does that mean for, for cosmological uh, phenomena? Um, and so I, I just want to remind people um, that if we make some reasonable assumptions about, uh, the, about the structure of um, dark matter, um, about, you know, it's cold, so it's non-relativistic, it's not fast moving. And I, I didn't say this earlier, but I want to remind, you know, the students who are wondering, like, how can I have an intuition for that? The easiest way to remember that is with structure formation. It takes galaxies a really long time to form. If the particles are um, relativistic, it's really hard to build a galaxy with it. Um, if the particles are short-lived, then you can't build the galaxy because they're not around long enough to have gravitational impact. So this is a really nice way to use structure formation to have some intuition. Um, it turns out that if you make reasonable assumptions about pretty much any scalar dark matter candidate, then you're going to get a, an equation of motion that looks like this. Um, so let's like ignore the, the gravitational term for a second, and then let's even actually ignore this, this term in the middle. So if you just look at the first two terms, this look, should look fairly familiar. It's essentially the Schrodinger equation. 
adding in the middle term, it becomes known as the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Um, to people in atomic physics, this is also known as the gross pateyevsky equation. Um, and then adding in this gravitational interaction, because we do expect you know, dark matter's primary interaction, if not its only interaction, is gravitational. There is also, um, so this becomes the nonlinear Schrodinger Poisson system when you include both the self interaction terms. So this comes from that fight of the four. This is a non relativistic limit. So um, I've changed fields, I've, I've made a couple of approximations, and there is this self interaction there. Um, it's not really gross Pateyevsky if the self interaction isn't there. I, it's, I'm emphasizing. I am the presence of these terms or the absence of these terms quite a bit, because one of the things that I want to say, particularly to the students in the audience or the people who don't usually think about axions, is it's important when you pick up a paper on axions to look at which terms are present and which ones aren't there, because they're actually different sets of assumptions. And so, for example, a lot of the fuzzy dark matter papers you see out there that use that terminology actually ignore the self-interaction term in the middle. Um, so I, I just want people to, to pay attention to that. Um, and, you know, ask the question when you're reading a paper, like how would this shift if, if the self-interaction was present? And a really good example of this, I'm, I'm now realizing I probably should have included a slide about this. Um, you know, there's a lot of discussion right now that uh, constraints from the Lyman Alpha Forest mean that 10 to the minus 22 EV ultralight axions are no longer viable. But there's actually a really nice paper um, led by De Jacques in, in 2018 that shows that if you restore the self-interaction term to your analysis, that actually that Lyman alpha constraint either goes away or becomes a lot weaker. Um, so some of the constraints that are being put out there is gospel on you know, what mass can ultralight axions have and still remain a viable dark matter candidate depend on some assumptions that come from which equation of motion are we starting with in our, in our analysis. So the reason that this equation pops up in um, uh, atomic physics is because it's what describes Bose-Einstein condensates in the laboratory. Um, there's for years been a debate about whether axion dark matter forms Bose-Einstein condensates and exactly what form that takes. Uh, some of you have seen me give talks over the years about some of the early work I did on this. Um, so along with Alan Guth and Mark Hertzberg, um, for the QCD axion, um, I see, thank you. Um, for the QCD axion, um, the answer is yes, and these should be in small locally correlated solitons. So these are known in the literature as Bose stars or standing waves. There was a hint of this in um, a simulation that Klebnikov and Kachev did in 2000. I still, I wish more people would read this paper. It's such a beautiful paper. It also has some like weird tantalizing things in it that they don't completely spell out. Um, so one of the takeaways of our paper is that the sign of the interaction really matters. So it matters whether you have an attractive self-interaction, whether that fight of the four term is attractive. And then the mass is also going to determine the coherence length. So for a lower mass um, axion like particle or boson dark matter, you're going to have a larger de Broglie wavelength. And so then, for example, with ultralight axions, you can get halos with solitons at their core. So you can get a whole dark matter halo that is, for example, about the scale of a dwarf galaxy, which is one of the reasons people got excited about 10 to the minus 22 um, EV mass is because it gives you that dwarf galaxy halo. Um, so just before I, I stop, I, I just want to say like, you know, a few things that first of all, there are still some of these technical issues. Um, about for cosmological purposes, is it a classical field or do we have to take quantum effects into account? Um, and also what is the role of the self interaction? Um, so there's a nice paper from 2018 um, by Lefkoff et al. Um, that argues that axions evolving under their own self gravity are not a standard Boltzmann collision process. And this is important because people have been making the assumption that they can uh, do their uh, 
uh, systemic evolutions using the Boltzmann equations. So in a paper that was just published in PRD last year um, with my student, Tony Mirasola, we show that you need to use the Wigner formalism. And this is really for the formation of the Bose-Einstein condensate. So this is the other thing. When you're looking at simulations, some people just assume a soliton is there. They place the soliton in the simulation, and then they let it go and see what happens. Um, when you're trying to form the soliton in the first place, you really have to have some care. We also find that the self interactions um, do matter. So you can't just drop this phi to the four term. We do find that they're subdominant in setting the time scale for initial condensation. So this is something people had been assuming kind of in a hand wavy thing, way for years, but had never been shown analytically. So we actually, for the first time, show analytically how you should calculate this time scale for the self interactions. Um, so you might walk away from that thinking, okay, if it's subdominant compared to gravity, it doesn't matter. Um, but actually with my, my graduate student, Noah Glennon, I'm, I've actually been running simulations that find that self interactions are significant for the dynamical evolution of the system. So just to give you all some quick intuition for this, this is from um, a paper that Noah and I have on the archive. It's um, got to revise and resubmit from PRD. So it's actually hopefully going back to PRD sometime in the next week. Um, so for, just because I'm low on time, I'm just gonna have people focus on the left side of the slide, which is what you have is a soliton. So this is already, it's a soliton, it's already formed. It's orbiting a central gravitational potential. And what you're seeing is the soliton time-stepped. So each appearance of it in, in the box is a different time. And this is about um, uh, seven giga years, I think. Um, and what you can see is with no self interactions, with attractive self interactions, and with repulsive self interactions, the tidal stripping of the soliton is different. The time scale for the tidal stripping is different. So, why do we care? Well, we're looking at tidal stripping of dwarf galaxies right now. And so, it really matters what is the time scale for the tidal stripping of the dark matter core if you have a soliton. Um, just quickly, the things that you're looking at in the middle is two solitons orbiting each other um, if there's no self-interaction, and then two solitons orbiting each other if there is an attractive self-interaction. So the interaction matters once the object has formed, even if um, for the purposes of forming the soliton, the self-interaction takes too long and needs the help of gravity. Um, Okay, so I'm almost done, Ryan, and then I, I will get to your question. Um, quickly, what techniques should we emphasize as we seek to answer these questions? So I just want to point out that here in the US, we're under we're doing the snow mass process right now. I'm actually a topical convener for cosmic probes of dark matter. So there's, you know, there's all of these direct detection, indirect detection, particle colliders, astrophysical probes. This is how it was articulated in the last snow mass process. So this is our community planning process. Um, I just want to point out that indirect detection is also an astrophysical probe. Like, for example, if the galactic center excess really is um, uh, due to dark matter annihilations, that's an astrophysical probe that's also an indirect detection. Um, when we're thinking about looking at like small scale objects, tidal stripping, um, observatories like the Vera Rubin Observatory, where I'm a member of the DESC collaboration, are going to be really important. Um, and this is you know, there are different ways we can look for ultralight axions. Here's a white paper that we submitted to the astronomy decadal about different ways that they can be constrained through astrophysical processes. We can also look for um, axions that are being produced thermally in objects like neutron stars. We can look at neutron star cooling. I'm leading the dark matter search team on Strobex, which is a proposed X-ray telescope. Um, and then very quickly, I just want to come back to the nuclear um, equation of state for um, neutron stars that, again, the presence of dark matter in the core of the neutron star can make a difference. Um, for this, we're really thinking not so much about ultralight axions or even EV scale, but for example, asymmetric dark matter models where you have KEV scale or heavier can either um, collect in the core of the dark matter or form uh, of the neutron star or form a halo. And this can have an, an impact on the equation of state. And right now, actually, some of the work that I'm doing is starting to um, model what these equations of state would look like and compare with um, data from NICER, which is a little X-ray telescope that lives on the International Space Station. Um, 
So one of the ways that we're getting information is by looking at hotspots on neutron stars. So this is just a nice animation of how we're gathering information. And this allows us to um, gather, uh, to get us to um, do analyses that give us insight into the mass, the radius, the equation of state. Um, there's a paper on the archive, which you can look at about that. And then I just wanna argue with this one slide that high energy astrophysics is maybe in, partly, in part the future of high energy physics that we can place constraints on axions using gamma ray observations and um, uh, X-ray observations. Um, so I'll stop there and I'm, I'm happy to take questions. I think I saw Ryan had a question. Thank you very much, Chanda, for this, for this nice talk. So yes, uh, please, Ryan, please. Uh, yeah, so this was really interesting. Um, I've uh, wondered a lot when people talk about axions, whether or not, you know, you need to take quantum fields, quantum effects into consideration. And every time I've asked somebody who says large population number, we can always do a classical field. Um, so I was just curious in your opinion, if, uh, you know, it, is, is everything under control? Uh, and would there be value in um, doing some kind of test of this formalism in an analog system. So I know there's papers where you can create self-interacting, self-gravitating effectively BECs. Um, and so I was just curious if, um, if you consider this kind of like a closed problem or if the, the question of how quantum effects actually affect structure formation are settled. So first of all, yes, you gave me an excuse to use one of my extra slides. I am. Um, and is everything under control? No, we're theoretical physicists. So of course, like nothing's under control. <laughs> um, so I, I think in part, the answer that I want to give you is that the, the, the lore before Bose-Einstein condensates were created in the lab at all. So before the 90s, you pick up any textbook that was published before like 1997, basically. And they all say that in order to form a stable Bose-Einstein condensate, the, there, either it has to be non-interacting or it has to have an effective repulsive self-interaction. And so the very first thing that people did when they um, when it became clear that you could make Bose-Einstein condensates in the lab was test this. And they tested it with lithium-7, which has a negative scattering length, which is an effective attractive interaction. So the theory said that it should not form a stable BEC, but then they were actually able to form one. The key piece um, was that there were only so many particles that you could put into the condensate before it would collapse. Um, and I say there's a tilde here because actually there's a big fight about how many atoms were actually in the condensate. It may have been 10,000 and not 1,000. There's lots of bad AMO experiments that seems hard and confusing to me. Um, I, so th this is what they found. Um, there's now literature that kind of shows how this works. So Pierre-Henri Chavanis has like a nice couple of papers from both 2011 and 2016 that show that there are maximum masses. And this is one of the reasons associated with the attractive self-interaction. This is one of the reasons that I keep like pushing people about not excluding that fight of the four term. And so I didn't show it, but part of what Noah and I did um, let me see if I can do this without closing things. Part of what Noah and I did um, in this paper, which I encourage people to look at um, with these simulations is we were checking. So Chavanis um, in, his, in his paper um, uses the Gaussian, uses a, a Gaussian ansatz for all of it because it's, it's, it's very hardcore, it's beautiful analytic work. So I don't want to sound like I'm knocking it. But basically what we do is we check with numerics, whether we get the same thing if we're just doing this with a numerical code. And it's with um, a NOAA took pi ultralight, which is a code that Richard Easter developed and modified it um, in, a, in a couple of different ways, including to add the self interactions back into it. And so we checked both with the Gaussian ansatz and then more broadly. And we find the same things that Chavanese was finding with um, the, you know, there's a maximum mass before things destabilize or basically collapse into a black hole and that kind of thing. Um, as to whether, like how good gravitational analogs are, I, I don't know. I will say that one of the things that Tony, my other graduate student is working on is calculating what the critical temperature is if you put axions into a gravitational potential, because 
you know, when I say things, are, it's a bunch of theoretical physicists, we've been doing a lot of hand waving about large occupation number, therefore universe is cold enough, but no one's ever actually analytically calculated that temperature. So I probably just took up all the Q and A time, but you just asked me the question that I love being asked, so. <laughs> Thank you very much. So uh, is there a further question? So that does not seem to be the case. There's another question, yes. Is there one? I didn't see it. A low, a lower end. Yeah, Ryan, I think do you have a question or we should? Hello, please. Ah, oh, sir, I, I, I just had my hand up from before, sorry. Okay, no problem, that's all. I'm happy for people to email me okay. if you want to talk further or have questions later. Yeah, yes. There okay. is, is the Slack channel too. Yeah, thank okay. you very much. So, uh, so thank you very much for, for, your, for your nice presentation. And so I remind now that now the photo is taken. So please, uh, please uh, switch your camera on. Okay. And and we are taking photographs. Please, everybody, yeah, switch the camera on, please. Okay, here we are. Okay. Luca, Enrique, how are you doing? I'm still taking. Eh? I'm dying. Good. You are done for the three. I have like three, how do you say, three screens of people. The second one already, some have not opened. And uh, I'm with the third. You took the three? I so take it five. Okay, so just a just, uh, few seconds more, and please smile. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So, are you done, Enrique and Luca? I am done. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So thank you very much to everybody. Please be there at five because today we have to be on sharp on time uh, before the outreach. Okay. Um, thank you very much, um, um, Andreas, for yes. your to you. so, so, yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Fine. See you in a few minutes. At five. Okay. Yes. Our break. Thank you. Okay. So even Anna opened her screen. Anna, are you still there? Yes. Yes, okay, that's that's a great honor. Thank you. And uh, okay, now I have to put my mask back.